My name is Caleb Corrin, I'm with KPMG, and uh, I'm excited to talk with you today about uh, HTTP header for security. Uh, one of several, as we were just discussing in the back, that are available these days. But uh, before we dive in, the title of the talk about inducing amnesia in the browser, that came to me as I thought a little bit about what this header does. And we'll get to that in due to course, right? That's what the, the talk is about. But does anybody remember uh, those old black and white movies when there was like uh, maybe like an evil um, therapist or, or psychotherapist with like an amulet, you know, and he would wave the amulet slowly and say, you will not remember anything that's about to happen or what we talked about. Um, this header we're going to talk about today is a little bit like that or a little bit like in the even older movies, the black and white, where you had Dracula and his like piercing eyes and he would, you know, kind of hypnotize somebody into behaving a certain way. We've got a little bit of that today with the ClearSight data header. Um, but as I always have, I'd like to kind of frame the conversation before we dive into the nuts and bolts. Like, this may be an annoying question, but what, what do you guys think our mission is in, in security? What, what's, why do we get out of bed in the morning and come to work? Like, what do our bosses expect us to do? I have a guess and I have some thoughts on it, but I'd love to hear any of you guys' ideas before I dive in. Reduce risk. I love it. Um, anything else we would add on to that? Because that's money, reputation. What about money and reputation? Money, the business. Save money. Save money? Yeah, and uh, the reputation. Okay, and the reputation. Okay. Here's, here's my shot at it, which I think we're probably going pretty close in the same direction. I, I, I believe that our role, our mission when we get out of bed in the morning, every Monday when we get up and go to work is pretty straightforward, right? Because we're, we're not really like usually generating revenue for our or enterprise. We're reducing cost. And cost is kind of like for us risk because it just means unpredictable timing or amount of cost, right? We're trying to prevent breaches and bad things in security. That's just unpredictable cost. But that's it. Boom. Like you said, at the end of the day, we need, just like a salesperson, a salesperson has a quota of how much, how much volume they're supposed to sell every year. If they want to keep their job in security, we better be reducing a pretty significant amount of risk every year, or uh, we should probably have some conversations. So our talk today is a little bit about a tool that is low investment, and uh, sustainable uh, to reduce risk, right? Because that's our mission. So with that being said, oh, and by the way, it's not just reducing risk, it's reducing risk sustainably at the right cost and, and fast. Okay, with those parameters around it, let's dive in. Um, oh, let's see. There we go. All right, so real quick, who am I? Why, why do we care about anything I might or might not have to say here today? Um, I belong to KPMG's cyber practice, right? A lot of people when they think about KPMG think uh, tax or audit, uh, all those types of really fun things. Um, I'm in a separate part of the organization that's all about risk consulting. Um, way, 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 way down into a separate bucket uh, where we talk about cyber security. So with that being said, we've got about 3,000 people around the planet actually devoted to just this, um, in case you're not familiar with this. But the thing that, again, matters to this is uh, the starred part about keeping it simple. Uh, we can get into the nuts and bolts all day. We're happy to do that. We love that. But we have a balance. And Adrian Porterfeld this morning in her opening keynote referred to the balance of like letting the business move and all these security controls we can put around it as an overall theme to how we think about our work, right? That's the way we approach it when we're dealing with our clients. So what are HTTP headers? Uh, anybody have much experience? I know Scott Behrens in the back of the room has tons of experience with uh, HTTP headers. Um, anybody have uh, heard of something called like content security policy, for example? A lot of heads nodding. Yeah. Any firsthand experience implementing content security policy? <laughs> right, head, sorry. <laughs> some, some, some scars, right, lessons learned. Um, so anyways, the point of this slide is simply to remind us like this phenomenon about reducing a lot of risk, hopefully quickly, at low cost. That's, that's the message of HTTP headers for security, right? Um, we've been doing this for some time now. I, this is not a complete list. There's a lot more than this. These are just some examples of some of the bigger ones maybe over time that you may have heard of and when they came on the scene. On the right-hand side, that, that um, first appeared is probably a little hazy because it's kind of hard to declare when it really like launched, but it's directional, okay, for the point of the conversation. What we really see here is that these things, we have more over time, and there's conversations maybe that are appropriate around how we decide 
which ones are the right ones for the industry now, and how do we govern and manage all these things? Because you know, every year a new header means more things people like us have to learn what's the right one for the business and, and our mission right now. But long story short is we have uh, a header for just about everything these days. Um, you know, whether that's the big ones from the OWASP top 10 like cross-site scripting or um, you know, content security policy did a really good job of that. Uh, we've got the old classic click jacking stuff that XFrame Options was built to handle, et cetera. Like, I think we get the idea. There's a lot of X HTTP headers. It's in our interest to learn them because again, there's zero hardware to install. There are no support contracts with vendors. Those are things our bosses love, right? It's just a matter of maybe getting them these in the backlog and prioritizing them appropriately with the dev teams or the ops folks, right? So big, big, big messages. When we go back to work on Monday again and we say, hey, hey boss, what did we learn at AppSec California? We can say, these HTTP header things, I've got something for you. We're gonna eliminate an entire class of vulnerabilities with a header. Um, it may be the ClearSight data header or one of these, but pound for pound, these are things that justify you sending me to AppSec California. Okay. All right, so quick aside, how many people here have heard of this thing called GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation? Is that what it is? Okay, I got it right. Um, so essentially, like, that's a big deal, right? Our bosses do care about that. The business cares about reduction of um, risk again, right? And not getting in trouble with the regulators around privacy violations. So um, if we agree that that's something we care about because our bosses care about that and the business cares about that, um, here's the guiding lights behind this one. Um, you're only supposed to collect what is adequate for you, the purpose, right? The business purpose. It better make sense why you're collecting this one. And then you don't collect more than that thing. Okay, just rules of the road. And I think in a lot of our dev shops or organizations where we work, we also hear other guidance around, hey, limit what you collect because maybe if it's um, with a third party cloud provider or even in our classic data centers, the more uh, server space you take up, that's more cost. We don't want that, okay? So limiting what we collect is important. Now, all of this is on the uh, kind of enterprise side, right? What we're here to talk today about is on our end user side in the browser, what data persists, okay? But the, the principle is the same. Less is more if we can, if we can do it. And so the ClearSight data header that we're gonna dive into is a, is a tool that we didn't have until now that allows us to better manage that. Um, so. Cool, all right, why do we need this thing called a ClearSight data header? There's a class of stuff that as web application builders, um, we may leave behind. You know how when we go camping, there's always those signs that say leave no trace, you know, clean up behind yourself. That's not always been very easy um, with web applications, right? There's kind of hacky ways to get rid of stuff that persists on the, on, the end, on the user agent, on the browser, when we're done. But there's not a really great way to uh, clean up after ourselves. But what we can do now is that uh, the ClearSight data header actually allows us like more scalpel-like to clear out just the things that may reduce the right risk while balancing the performance reasons that we probably put that stuff there in the first place, right? We allow the browser to cache things like CSS, JavaScript, whatever class of stuff, the cookies probably most importantly, that manage the experience with us and our end users. Um, but again, like I said, until now we haven't had a, a very decent way to get rid of it. And that sounds like probably um, something that causes alarm bells to go off. As security people, stuff we leave behind um, is, oftentimes risky. So here's a tool for us, right? Um, essentially at the end of the day, the ClearSight data header allows us to blast away that stuff that we have um, suspicions could be actually increasing risk for us and the users. Um, now the problem is, is that this isn't very straightforward, right? Actually the details are where it gets a little tricky, but um, at least then we have a tool to take care of it. And we'll talk about the details here in a second, but pound for pound, like let's imagine um, our site was compromised by a persistent cross-site scripting attack, right? Uh, we need, every time our user goes back to our website again, because of stuff that's cached and living on their end, they, they're still experiencing the same thing. The ClearSight data header allows us to blast away like a fire hose, all of those things that keep calling back the persistent cross-site scripting attack so that, hey, clean slate, that's very powerful. It wasn't, wasn't really easy before. Um, Oh, and by, yeah, this first one is um, you know, kind of more around the privacy side of things. 
there's, there's several sites out there that, you know, let's imagine a, um, someone in a place where the websites that they visit may get them in trouble for whatever set of reasons, right? People in places where there's a lot of scrutiny from um, the powers that be um, that maybe uh, need some protection for that type of behavior. The ClearSight data header is one of these tools where you can actually remove all traces of that visit from their browser, okay? That's pretty powerful. That's important. Okay, so here's the details. Um, there are several directives that we can embed in the header and when we send it from the server to the end user um, of what stuff to blast away and remove from the browser so that no longer does it persist. Uh, cache, right, classic stuff. Cookies, uh, storage, which means like the index DB, I believe, and, and that type of fun stuff. Um, and execution context is actually kind of a little bit bizarre angle on this, but this will tell you, tell the browser to reload, refresh the page, um, thereby invoking the kind of clearing behavior that we just asked for, okay? And then finally, the asterisk, the wild card, you can say, do all this. You know, I'm not gonna spell it out for you, but blast away all these things. It's rather straightforward, right? It takes the same shape as probably some of the other headers we're familiar with, like content security policy or uh, strict transport security and the way we talk about the directives to the browser. But does it make sense so far? Am I laying out the business case for this? I hope pretty, pretty well. All right, so you say, well, all right, well, it's one thing to have the header, but how many browsers actually will do this when we send it? So um, pretty good news on this front. Um, I think it's safe to say that this was probably most high profile for Chrome and Mozilla. Both of those browsers have supported and it's live now in those browsers. Um, you know, if we've watched the, the kind of change in the, I'll say the market share of the different browsers over the years, we know that there's just, you know, a couple that really mean the most these days, right? The market share of certain browsers has gone down while the others have gone way up. So if we have the right ones, um, if we put this header out there uh, in the right ones, we're good to go because most of our users are gonna enjoy the benefits. So pound for pound, if Chrome and Firefox are taken care of, uh, that's good, right? Okay, so, and that's true. Like these both support ClearSight data header. Um, on the bottom row, I did want to address that. Anybody familiar with the news that came out in December? about um, the kind of code base behind Microsoft's browser plans. Anybody want to give a quick recap of what happened? Right, thank you. Yep, Microsoft is dropping their proprietary um, engines and browser engines in favor of Chromium. So the back end of the next browser that Microsoft puts out um, is, is gonna run on Chromium, the same kind of uh, back end Chrome runs, obviously, and uh, Firefox borrows heavily from. So that's a huge deal. But one of the things it means for us as implementers is we can say, hey, boss, the back end of the browser that will run the enterprise you know, in due course um, will support the headers we're, we're building in now. So that's another strong argument. Oh, wrong direction. Okay, so that's the good news, right? We have a lot of really powerful privacy and security um, options when we use ClearSight Data Header. And I do want to suggest that when we go back to work on Monday, we have a, a, a list of things that we've learned at AppSec California, and we kind of put this in the backlog of suggestions we're going to make, and again, help justify our visit here. Right? But there's maybe some things that weren't um, expected when they designed the ClearSight Data Header that maybe bad guys or attackers might enjoy about this, right? One of the things we know bad guys and attackers enjoy is they, they like easy targets. They also don't like to be seen after they've exploited the target, okay? So the ClearSight data header um, enables, like we said before, you to erase the tracks of an interaction between a web server and the, and the end user, the user agent, right? So here's an example of what that might look like. Um, I may have a phishing campaign and I you know, bring you to my website, you enter your credentials and you go back along your merry way and I've got your credentials to whatever important site it is. The forensics guys in the organization come in and they say, give me your laptop. And they say, there's nothing on, I have no idea what happened. There's no record anymore of that engagement with the site that would otherwise allow me to go, you know, probably blacklist that host from ever entering the environment again or being called from one of my users. I don't have that anymore. Of course, I do recognize that there are the network teams who saw it come through in the first place, 
but we're still raising the cost of security for uh, our, our teams. Is that making sense, that scenario? Same thing for mal, uh, drive-by downloads, right? If I can, you know, as you visit my watering hole and get folks from your organization to drive, um, pull down executables and execute them, and I send this header along with it, it just makes the job harder of your enterprise security teams who need to clean up that mess or know what the heck happened. Right? It's gone. So you can probably start to imagine some controls or um, mitigations around this scenario. Uh, we'll bake it into the recommendations here at the end, but um, maybe there's some monitoring we want to do for the clear site data header. Okay, so this one is a little maybe more esoteric. And Dan Veditz of Mozilla, um, I don't know if the folks in the room know Dan. Um, Dan actually, several years ago, was part of a, a presentation here on, on uh, content security policy with me and Scott in the back row there. Um, header um, uh, proponent. Anyways, Scott, Dan put this um, issue on GitHub about the ClearSight data header. He said, wait a second, um, maybe the, the use of this header has some unintended consequences in terms of how it can affect the browser. And essentially, I'll, I'll tell the story maybe a little bit better than the slide does. But let's say I um, can set headers from foo.example.com, just some subdomain, right? And I send this header out down to the user who visits foo.example.com, this host that I control. Anybody who visits example.com is also affected by what I sent from my subdomain. Now that's, we're not really sure how big of a security risk that is like in the grand scheme of things, is that a huge deal? But it's a deal that we don't want to not know about. So let's say for example that your enterprise um, sometimes what we see is some subdomain will be uh, given out to some marketing team or organization to, to execute on some project, right? Some high, high um, visibility thing that the business needs. Let's say, okay, there's this team, we've outsourced to them, they're gonna be in charge of the subdomain. They may or may not um, be as secure as the rest of the enterprise and that, that would be a way that some malicious attacker could come in and execute something like this, thereby flushing the cookies or the other important stuff that you may have wanted to persist across the whole domain. Is that tracking? Does that make sense? Cool. So um, again, it, it, to my knowledge, this hasn't been really addressed yet by the um, folks who wrote the spec for ClearSight data header. Um, I don't think this means it's a bad header to use. It's just something to keep in mind. Uh, before I get much farther, are there any questions about how this works or, or the why? I see this more as an offensive tool mm -hmm. versus a de defense, but I get your point. You can maybe track some of that telemetry to see yep. if they're actually leveraging those, that tool set. Yep. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting concept. Um, I'd be curious to see what research has to yeah. say. I think we're driving in the same direction. So like thank you for that. Forensic-wise, it would be hard versus, like, seeing something that replies on, like, wire shoes. Yep. Use, yep. Like cool. Thank you. We've got about five minutes left, right? Okay. All right. No problem. So here's the thing is that this header is probably meant, I mean, let's think about it. We probably don't want to, like a lot of these headers we're talking about are sent on just about every uh, response from the server. You know, whether it's content security policy or HSTS, those are sent all the time. 100% of requests, you shoot it out the door to the browser. Most of the time, ClearSight data is usually sent maybe on logout because we need that cookie during the session. We don't want to blast it away on every, on every interaction. So upon logout, we say, boom, ClearSight data, clean up after ourselves. So it's not the type of thing that we can easily scan the web for like you can for a lot of these headers. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of sites out there that measure adoption of these headers over time. And we can see like strict transport security and content security policy growing, 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 growing. That's great news. This is not the type of thing we should expect to find being sent very often, because it should only probably be sent upon like logout or other special events. So um, with that said, regardless, we, we ran a quick kind of sample scan of like the Alexa top 1 million, um, Cisco umbrella, which is a, a similar data set. It's a little bit more, it's like Alexa top 1 million, as you guys probably remember, is the most popular sites out there. Um, Cisco Umbrella is more about what are the most common hosts that send traffic around the web, because Cisco has all these vantage points, you know, on the back end of what we're doing out there on the network. And then httparchive.org, if anybody's familiar with that, um, or not familiar, I'd definitely recommend a look. It's a very powerful tool for measuring adoption of technologies and um, kind of practices that the way we build the web. 
So you can use that database because they scan the web, I think now every month, and allow you to um, use the Google console, like Google BigQuery, to dive into that data. And you can see really cool stuff. But anyways, so what we did is we looked back over through like September, and I only found about five sites, period, <laughs> across each of these scans that have implemented uh, ClearSight data on every request you go ask them, okay? That's not surprising. It's probably not the normal use case for this, um, and it's a brand new header. But if anybody's interested in which ones, we can maybe talk afterwards, and I'd be happy to, we have a question already on that. I'll catch up with you afterwards, and we can share on that. I'll share this. It, there doesn't really seem to be a great reason for why they're there. <laughs> okay. Well, see, uh, I didn't see it on any sensitive sites. Uh, I, I was maybe, I had a hypothesis that if you see this out there, maybe it is one of these phishing sites or a malicious site, right? So if, because they, won't, they wanna hide their tracks from the interaction. I didn't find that either. Um, so for what it's worth, I either, we didn't hit these sites that are using it and doing bad things, or they haven't caught on and started using this yet, but. Cool. All right, so here's the what you do now. When you go back to work, my, my suggestions are just a couple, maybe, maybe three. Uh, I have one I'll try to remember that's not here. Um, number one is, you know, go back to work on Monday and say, hey boss, I heard about this thing called the ClearSight data header. It has security and privacy benefits, super low level of effort, moderate um, risk reduction ability to us. We should investigate it and put it in the backlog. Um, at least to test it and play around with it. Okay, that's recommendation number one. But again, we're balancing the business value of maybe blasting away some of those things that d the developers and the um, product owners want to keep for performance reasons. So that's the conversation you want, like the, the nuance and sophisticated approach, not just the security thou shalt. It's this is the best thing for the business because we're going to leave the things that maximize performance benefits and just remove the right things at the right time for security and privacy. That's probably the angle you want to tackle it with. Second is you want to watch out for maybe some people with bad intentions who may be using the ClearSight data header. And this is probably pretty straightforward. Um, ask the, the security operations team or your cyber fusion center, what do you guys call it in your organization? Say, hey, uh, I'd like your content people to write an alert for whenever the ClearSight data header comes through the door. And if that header is sent by something that's not a very popular site, maybe something that was born in the last week or has no traffic history or is not very popular, I consider sending somebody to look at that. And if it's bad, you know, blacklist that guy. So just a monitoring recommendation. Again, it's not top of priority, but when the team has time, appropriately prioritize that. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay, cool, great. Uh, time for questions and answers, if there are any. I'll try to answer. Sir? So, have you seen an attack where they're running this header? I've not, no, it's theoretical at this point. Uh, the question was, have I seen an attack doing that? And I said, not yet. Uh, next question. Is there anything in the standardization roadmap to try and address some of these issues? Mm, could you be more specific before you hand the mic away? Um, is there any activity under, under IETF or whoever's mm. handling um, these, the standardization of these headers mm -hmm. uh, to try to make any modifications to the spec in order to try and address some of these issues? Like For instance, subdomains. Yeah. I'm not aware of any traction on the concerns that have been raised here yet. Um, and that may be appropriate, but um, for what it's worth, I've not seen anybody acknowledging it, at least publicly. Uh, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when did this, when did this uh, become implemented as standard? Uh, um, the standard was probably ratified in 2017 or so. I think it came live in Firefox uh, in the fall of 2018. It was in Chrome probably over the summer or so. So brand new, brand new. This is pretty, pretty off the presses, right? So I wouldn't expect it to be out there very much. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if attackers are all over it. So, you know, probably makes sense what we're seeing so far. Terrific, any other questions or thoughts? All right, thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Remember the mission when you go back to work on Monday.